Hello everyone and welcome to the TFMA Summer Blockbuster Series. My name is Kate Calabro. I am a 2012 FMA graduate and I'm currently the treasurer of the TFMA Alumni Association Board. These virtual movie, club, um, movie clubs were created for us to stay connected during these current times and have proven to be a wonderful platform for us to continue to stay connected with students and alumni outside of Philadelphia. We hope that you're enjoying the series as much as we enjoyed putting it together. It is my pleasure now to introduce Professor and FMA Department Chair Paul Swan, who will be leading tonight's discussion. Thanks so much. Hi, uh, I'm Paul Swan, and I'm delighted to introduce this evening one of our most illustrious alums. Uh, this is Billy Goldenberg, who, uh, Billy, if you'd like to turn on your uh, screen, thank you very much. Uh, Billy is uh, an editor who has a great acclaim for a number of films made in Hollywood. Uh, when I went through his IMDb listing, I couldn't believe all the films that he'd worked on uh, and nominated four times for the Academy Award for Editing, films like Sea Biscuit, The Insider, and then in 2012, uh, for two films in the same year, Ben Affleck's Argo, that we're going to be talking about tonight, and Catherine Bigelow's Zero Dark Thirty, winning the Oscar for uh, editing Argo. Um, Billy graduated from our program in the early 80s and has had a very successful career as an editor. Uh, in order to get started, I'd like us to have a look at the trailer for Argo and then we're going to hear from Billy himself. So if we can play the trailer, please. Maybe we should just dispense with showing the trailer. Oh, here we go. That's another sound. Okay, and so Billy, maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about your experience of working on Argo. I have a whole series of questions from uh, our students and alums. Uh, just for background, it's based on a true story, which is sort of strange because Zero Dark Thirty is based on a true story as well. Uh, I rewatched it last night and couldn't believe how well it held up. 
but uh, if you'd like to talk a little bit about the film before I, I field some of these questions, uh, have at it. Well, Argo was my second film with Ben Affleck, so we already had a pretty good working relationship. We did uh, Gone Baby Gone a few years earlier than Argo. So, um, you know, so which made it really helpful because I already had a, you know, a shorthand, you know, with him so that I didn't have to, when you, when you work with a new director, it can often be, you know, it can take uh, a, a few weeks or a couple of months for everybody to get comfortable with each other and get to know each other's habits and when the best time to talk and when the best time to listen is. And um, but Ben and I have got along really great on the first film, so it was very easy uh, for us on the second film. And, um, it, you know, it was an incredibly smooth process, to be honest. You know, we shooting went as planned and it was i was lucky enough to be on the set a few times and everything you know ben was in total control he he uh he learned a lot from his first film and was you know a very very seasoned director during the making of the film so it was a very smooth shoot and uh the post-production you know had its hiccups we to find the film you know it took it took uh, several months to find you know the film that's that it's in the theaters or was in the theaters so, you know, like any post-production process, it's a process and it takes time. You don't know what you are going to know in week 15, you know, in week one, you just don't know that, you know, you have to go through the process and, um, and learn your film and learn what the important parts are and, you know, what needs to stay in and what needs to go out. So um, it was a pretty, at no time that I think during the post process, oh, well, we're going to win best picture. So it doesn't really matter. I mean, it was, it was more like, are we ever going to find a good film in here? Is it ever going to come together? And, um, uh, you know, it obviously it did. And um, actually, uh, in post-production, we were struggling a little bit. We had what we thought was a very good film, but it wasn't a great film. And we actually showed the film to, uh, Ben showed the film to Bradley Cooper. And um, Bradley really liked it, but he had a really great suggestion, and that was to... In the film, as it is now, there's very there's only one scene where you see his ex-wife or his estranged wife, and there used to be several scenes with her, and with and, and several phone calls with um, with her, his son. So there were phone calls between he and the wife, and there were phone calls with he and the son. Now there's only one phone call with the son, and no scenes, no phone calls with the wife. So, but Bradley looked at it and said, "This film." stands on the thriller aspect of it and all this sort of marriage and personal stuff works fine without ever even just hearing about it and hearing Ben or Ben's character talk about it. So we, in one day, we removed all the scenes with, um, with Ben's wife and everyone but one with he and his son. And as soon as we did that, the movie clicked. It, it, we watched it that night or a couple nights later with about 50 people, recruited audience and we could just tell we had, you know, the movie had really clicked then. And, and, and so we owe a lot to Bradley for his great suggestion. It's, it's funny you should talk straight away about the relationship with Ben Affleck, because one of the questions that I have for you uh, posed by one of the alums is, what's it like to work with a director when you perhaps have competing visions or when a director has final cut? What, how, how does that relationship work? Are there, are there times when you want to do something very different from the director, or are you the one who is, does what they're told? To what, to what extent do you have sort of agency, or to what extent do you have to uh, follow what the director wants? Um, well, ultimately, it's the director's movie. So my attitude is I want to help him, you know, achieve his dream you know and um, find his film now I want to also bring something to the table I want to offer suggestions offer things that offer ideas that maybe he hadn't thought of or he or she hadn't thought of you know you want to bring something with you and um, but ultimately if the director wants to do something that I'm not happy with or I don't agree with I will I, I, I take the long game approach where I uh, you know, because like I said before, editing is a process. So if I feel really strongly about something during shooting or early in post-production, I'll mention it. And if the director doesn't agree, I'll just, okay. And, but I'll keep mentioning it and keep bringing it up as we go along. And they soon learn that I feel really strong about it that way. And 
you know, but ultimately they're going to do what they want to do. And, and even if I feel like I was right, it's their film. And, and you know, the, the fun thing and the also frustrating thing about film is, you know, there's usually not a right and wrong. It's, it's an opinion. It's some who's, someone's vision. So my job is to help them achieve their vision. So I, I tend to, I'll fight as hard as I can fight, but I don't get into screaming matches and I don't, and I don't, you know, throw things. Or I just try and be mature and constructive and state my reasons and hope they listen to me. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. In terms of Final Cut, you know, it's a great thing to work with a director who has Final Cut. I just finished a film with Paul Greengrass who does have Final Cut. But, you know, Final Cut is a, is a thing that, yeah, you can insist and say, okay, this is my cut. I don't care what you want. I'm not... I, but then, you know, the studio won't be enthusiastic about the film and, the, and, and you want the studio and especially the marketing people to really believe in what they're trying to sell and what they're trying to, you know, get out into the market. So, yeah, you can have Final Cut, but if you bully your way into getting the film you want, even though you have Final Cut, you know, you can do damage in other ways. Um, now, people like, I know that so Christopher Nolan has Final Cut and I think that I don't, I don't think he listens to anything the studio says and he's done quite well. So there are, you know, there are examples of that, but you know, I, most of the people I've worked with who have Final Cut tend to, um, you know, be very collaborative with the studio to a point. I mean, they don't want to do something to compromise their vision, but they'll listen and try things and, you know, because, you, you know, good idea is a good idea. So the studio has got a great idea. And even if the director's got Final Cut, like, why wouldn't you do it? So, um, but um, there's sort of a nice feeling about knowing you're working with a director as Final Cut. It sort of feels like you're a little bit protected. Now, I know we're talking about Argo, but I want to stay with this for a second. So you're talking about working with directors who know what they do. You don't have to mention any names, but have there been times when you've worked with a director who doesn't know what he or she is doing, and it ends up on you to kind of basically rescue them? A couple of times, yeah, with um, either directors who have done a couple of movies but just didn't find it when they were shooting whatever film it was. Um, you know, and, and you just sort of have to take a stronger hand when that happens. You have to, I mean, the one film I recut, I just, I really didn't had no, it was, it was unreleasable and we got the film good enough to, you know, be released and it made, made some money, especially overseas, it did, it did okay. So I didn't even have any, I didn't have any contact with the director at all during that film. So, um, but, you know, there's a, I made a, I'm hard not without mentioning names. I've made a, I, I cut a couple of films with the director who's really needs to be helped. And, uh, <laughs> But that's hard too, you know, that's, I have a lot of experience. So it's, you know, you got to, the thing about the job is you have to be ready for anything. You have to, you know, any, any situation that arises, you have to handle it in a professional and mature way and, you know, get the film, you know, through to the end in, in you know, as best as possible. So that's just part of the job. Now you started by talking about how uh, that kind of note from Bradley Cooper kind of rescued the film a little bit, but there are some parts of the film that are really kind of tour de force in terms of how editing is used to create a particular mood. So mm -hmm. one of the uh, students was asking, uh, how do you establish a particular tone or a particular mood? I mean, I... Honestly, I, I, when I was watching the the escape at the very end of uh, of the film, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I knew they were going to get away, but even so, I was still kind of in this kind of Pavlovian way. I, I knew that I was being kind of manipulated to be kind of excited, but there are other more nuanced ways in which editing is used throughout the course of the film. So. Uh, one of our questions has to do with, well, ha what, what's, your, what, what's your working method? How do you come up with a decision tree to decide to edit a particular sequence in a particular way? Well, that's a complicated question, but, you know, um, in terms of tone in that film, it was obviously difficult because we were trying to combine comedy and, you know, pulse pounding drama, hopefully. Um, so that was, that was a difficult 
difficult task. And there's a one particular sequence in the film where they do the read through of the screenplay, the fake screenplay. And we're combining, you know, the real, the hostages that got taken, the, the famous hostages that got taken, you know, um, prisoner and our, our, what they call house guests and uh, news around the world. And, and some of it's funny and absurd. The, the read through is, and all the costumes and some of it's deadly serious and there's a fake, there's a fake shooting, ga shooting gallery that they have, you know, a, a firing squad. And finding the balance of that was sort of the key to the film, finding a way to have all that, you know, put together and, and go together in a way that that's consistent and feels like it's all in the same film was, was very challenging. That, that, I use that ex sequence as an example of when we knew we could do that. I mean, at first we didn't, that was what we shot for when we were, and they were shooting it. That was what they was written for to be sort of combined the drama and the comedy. But until you actually do it, you don't really know if it's going to work. So the key with the comedy is to keep it within the same sort of bandwidth as the, as the drama. I mean, don't let it get too broad, you know, and don't let the drama get so serious that they can't, it'll never exist in the same world. So when I put that sequence together and it was, it took a long time to get it right and I saw that it worked, I knew that we could successfully pull off that tone. Um, and in terms of, you know, I've done a lot of films where people know the ending. I mean, I did Zero Dark Thirty and everybody know they got Bin Laden. But the idea is, is, you know, as an editor, is to get your audience so wrapped that they don't think about that. They're just in the film. And that's something that, that I've just gotten good at over time. I mean, it's, you know, it's a question of never letting anything finish when in those, you know, it's multi um, storylines happening at the same time. They're, you know, it's the Republican guard and our house guests and, you know, the, the guards at the airport and everybody's, you know, all those simultaneous storylines. It's always leaving things on a high, always leaving things on a high and never letting, let it, never letting the audience off the hook. Don't give them any time to breathe, don't give them any time to think so that they're so in, in, in engaged with your film, they don't think about um, you know, they don't think about the fact that, oh yeah, we know they got away. I mean, you know, right. just, um, we know they got Bin Laden. And in and, and the two films, it was, I did it in different styles. I mean, in, in Zero Dark Thirty, it was all about detail, you know, and all about the, these Navy SEALs and how they went through that compound and they didn't know it was around any, each corner and it was, they didn't, you know, whether it be nothing or a woman or uh, somebody with a gun, you know. So that was all about like, quiet and detail and like the meticulousness of the seals and, and the tension of that every footstep making a sound where Argo is much more of a fast paced more of a like you know a, more of a typical action scene but um where Argo I think is much more of a sort of it's a little more of a Hollywood movie where Zero Dark Thirty is a little more of a I guess a docudrama where it's you know there's no license taken with the truth. I mean, Argo, there were things in the script that I, it didn't happen in real life. In Zero Dark Thirty, we tried to stay accurate to the letter, you know? I mean, we, they, Catherine and Mark Ball had information I don't know how they got. And, you know, we were, we were sure to, to do that exactly as, as we understood it went down in the compound. But, um, you know, so uh, that's a sort of suspension of disbelief thing. It's, you have to find the style for that film that will let you do that. So, because it, it can be different in, any, in every film, but it's, you know, it's, it's about audience engagement. Hmm. Uh, you talked about how both Zero Dark Thirty and Argo are kind of different ways of approaching kind of actuality and historical events. Uh, one of the things that I was really struck by is how much of what you see in Argo is actually real things. We see Ted Koppel, we see all the other people or newscasters, but then, and this was very, to my mind, very kind of disturbing at the very beginning of the film, uh, all the uh, newsreel film of the beginning of the hostage crisis. And for the life of me, I couldn't tell what was staged or reenacted and what was actually archival. And I stayed to the very end of the credits to see mm -hmm. what the sources were for the archival material. But uh, can you talk a little bit about that process, about how you incorporate 
actuality footage, newsreel film with uh, stage footage. Well, it's interesting in Argo, in the screenplay, all the newsreel footage in the embassy takeover in the beginning was supposed to be real newsreel footage, and we had it. But what Ben and, um, and Rodrigo Pareto, the DP did, they had, they actually had 16 millimeter cameras and eight millimeter cameras on, on them. I'm not sure who had what, but then they also gave to eight millimeter and 16 mill millimeter cameras to just extras in the crowd. And they shot all that stuff. So all the newsreel in the opening is all shot by us. Um, because it was so, the newsreel footage we had of them jumping the fence, it was so grainy that it was really almost unusable. And when we shot all this stuff, it looks so good. I mean, I've, I've been asked this question before. Everybody thinks that stuff's real newsreel footage, and it is. It fooled me. Yeah. Um, and all, but in the screenplay, there were several times that they, Chris Terrio, the screenwriter, referred to different pieces of newsreel, like very, in very detailed, in a very detailed way. Because usually when there's newsreel footage in films, it's like, it's very general. They don't, you know, but they don't really know some, something exists. They just sort of like, well, you should have a newsreel thing of this particular event, but they don't really do the research. But Chris did very specific research and he had these clips that he knew existed for very specific reasons and to make very specific story points. But as we're putting the film together, I came, I added a few, I think I had the Walter Cronkite thing in, in the middle of that montage I was speaking about earlier. Um, there's a few Mike Wallace um, talking to the Ayatollahs I put in, but a lot of it was, um, a lot of it was Chris Terrio had written into the screenplay. And in fact, it was, we had to track down all those people you can't use their likeness without permission, you know, so right. we got to track down all those people, like the one guy who talks about, you know, I think we should just kill them all, you know. Um, that guy now owns a gun shop uh, <laughs> somewhere, I think in Texas, but I might, might maybe wrong, but he owns a gun shop and uh, he gave us permission. We showed him the film, he gave us permission. They all, everybody did. So um, we, we did very lucky with the newsreel footage on that because at first, the network, I think it was CBS said no, um, because they w didn't want their, they don't like to take the newsreel footage and have it be used in a way that can tell sort of a, a different story that they were trying to tell. You know, you have to be accurate to what they were trying to say. You, you can use it in a way to make something seem like, you know, the opposite of what it really was, as we know from the media right now. Um, so they had a look at it. And then luckily for us, George Clooney was the producer of the film. and he knew somebody at CBS and made a call and, you know, they, they cleared it for us, but, we, but they were very careful about, about how we used it. And luckily we, we did everything the way they would have wanted. I mean, I, in the film, I did concussion, which is about concussions in football. We use a lot of footage from ESP, ESPN and HBO and all these different networks that I kept putting stuff into the film thinking that was all my stuff that I put in and, I kept putting stuff in the film thinking there's no way that, that, that no one's going to let us use this stuff because it just makes the NFL look so bad. And um, what the lawyers at Sony Pictures decided was that it was, um, it was germane to the story in the movie. So it's called fair use. So we're, we didn't even ask for the rights. We just used it saying it was, it, it's pertinent to the telling of this story. So we were able to use it without, getting the rights to it. And so. never, never got in trouble for fair use. They, they accepted that was fair. <laughs> I never got in trouble. No, I don't think, I don't think, you know, the NFL made enough problems for that film without having to do that. They, they didn't, they couldn't have sued us for it. And um, they made problems for the film in other ways. Okay. Now, several times you've mentioned kind of having some input while a film is being shot. Are you actually on set very often when a film is being shot? Uh, Argo, I was on the set, I think, two or three times. Uh, not That's all, because I'm constantly trying to stay up to camera, meaning cut every, like if I get, they shoot a scene on Monday, I get the dailies on Tuesday, I want to cut everything for, on Tuesday that I, they were shot on Monday, so I can constantly, and do that every day, so you have to work really hard to do that, so I can't spend much time on the set, uh, and able to and keep up. This past film, I asked, I did, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, this past film I did with Paul Greengrass, um, it's the second film I've done with him. I spent a lot of time on the set on that film. Uh, Paul and I have become really, really collaborative 
in a way that I've never had with another director in terms of he'll call me from the set and say, I'm about to shoot this shot where I was going to do this and do that. And what do you think? And I'd be like, well, you're asking me, <laughs> you're Paul Greengrass. Um, so, but it was incredible. And I, and I got, I was on the set on that, on, on just called the uh, news of the world. I was on the set 10, 15 times, like for a lot of the day too. So, which is a, a lot for me. Um, and uh, they shot a lot of nights. So I would go, I would cut all day and then I would go, to the set at night and hang out and you know I learned so much from him not just about directing in general but I learned so much about about what his intentions are by being on the set by listening to him talk so with him I have a, it's a really special relationship that way um, so I'm on the set way more than I would ever on any other film wow well the, the reason I asked that is that when I was watching Argo I was so aware that there was so much camera movement and uh, you're talking about Paul Greengrass. I mean, he's known for having so much camera movement. And yeah. so what, what kind of issues and problems and concerns does that pose for the editor working with that kind of footage? Well, you just have to make sure you're not using it. You, you know, you want to have, you don't want to have that agitation in a scene where there's no, you know, where it shouldn't be agitated. You know what I mean? So in Argo, it was very interesting because he sh Ben shot or Ben and Rodrigo shot all the stuff in Iran, uh, three perf, um, with uh, with um, um, so he would get a grainy. He wanted it to be really grainy. Um, he shot all the stuff in Hollywood. Um, what he tried, he, he didn't. He, they were going to shoot color rever reversal film, which wouldn't have been. There would be no negative. So they ended up doing a process that made it look like color reversal. And then all the stuff in the CIA in Washington was all shot steady cam. So we had three, they had come up with this idea of show, shooting three distinct styles to differentiate between the different the three major locations. And, um, you know, when the film, like, especially with Paul is, you know, the master of the jittery camera, uh, either mm -hmm. here, Catherine, one of the, Catherine Bigelow, one of the two, and I've cut for both of them. So I don't know, you get used to it in a way that it, it you get comfortable with it, you understand how to work. I mean, it doesn't really change my editing style so much that just the film being shot that way imposes its own style. The one thing you have to do is not get over too cutty with that kind of, with that kind of material because it just becomes blinding. You can't, your eyes can't follow it. So you just have to make sure you're not overcutting um, because the film, because the, the, way, the nature of the way the film shot induces its own energy. So you, a lot of times you don't have to cut because sometimes, you know, with a straight camera, you might run out of energy in a shot where when the, when the camera's always chasing like that, it, it really feels like immediate and, and it gives it its own sense of pace and own, sen own sense of energy. So you have to be aware of that. But it, um, you know, it's all storytelling. So you want to make sure if you're using that shaky camera where it's really shaky, you want to make sure it's for a reason, you know, and not just because it looked cool. Well, we had... David Lynch's editor came to Temple a couple of years ago, and she was saying how he basically edits so much in the camera that, you know, he's already edited it before it gets handed over to the editor. So it sounds as if you're doing something similar when you're working with Catherine Bigelow or, uh, or oh, Ben Affleck. I would say, no, I would say the opposite. <laughs> I would say that with Catherine, uh, or Paul Hall, and they have very similar, they use Barry Aykroyd, both of them use Barry Aykroyd as a director of photography, and they have similar styles, and no, it's, uh, Catherine shoots an enormous amount of film, always three or four, sometimes five or six cameras on everything, so you get a, you know, so you get everything from every angle you could possibly imagine, and then some ones you didn't imagine, so no, it's, in order to pick the best material, it, it's, it's not just cutting in the, it's not cutting in the camera in any way. It's actually, it's more like cutting a documentary than anything else. Wow. Just, just the nature of the way it's shot. I mean, in Zero Dark Thirty, we had the equivalent of about 400 hours of film, um, which, you know, whittled down to a two and a half hour film. So, I mean, I could have probably cut another version of that movie that would have been very good and not using any of the same material in either cut. Like, I got, you know, that, there was that much material and I could have also made like a documentary about Pakistan and Jordan. Like it's so much like incredible footage of the street life and, 
you know, the locals there, but you know, you can't use everything. So, right. Um, so I'm beginning to get some questions for you uh, on the chat, Billy. And actually, somebody's asking about another film that you edited, The Insider. Uh, would you yeah. be willing to sure. talk about that and move away from that? Okay, let me just paraphrase that. Uh, it says, in The Insider, there is a scene in where Russell Crowe's character is hallucinating when he's at rock bottom. For a movie that is very grounded, a scene like this would usually be risky since it come off as tonally inconsistent, yet it's pulled off seamlessly. When editing that scene, were there any concerns of balancing the tones or was there enough confidence in the material given to pull that scene off? That's really an interesting question. No, it's a very interesting question because I did cut that scene. I and mean, there were two, three of us on the film editors, but I did cut that scene. Um, you know, I had so much faith in that screenplay. It was Eric Roth wrote the screenplay with Michael Mann. And, you know, I just thought that was, if not the best screenplay I've ever read, it's definitely one of the top three. And I was nervous about that too. But uh, while I was editing it, I was so conscious of trying to just make it work, let alone work in the film, because it was very difficult to make work and to feel and to feel consistent with the rest of the film. Um, and then Michael, Michael picked that wallpaper that was, you know, he designed that wallpaper that was on the wall to match the garden so that when the, that the kids were in, that he was trying to reach out to his kids. So that, that was a match, that was a painting to match the garden so uh -huh. that that morph would look seamless. And then, but when he shot the, so he shot the motion in the hotel room on a motion control camera, but when he got out to the set to shoot the garden, he decided, oh, let's not use the motion control camera. We'll just put it on a dolly. <laughs> well, it's not going to go together that way. But so we'll, our visual effects supervisor was able to still make it work. So it was one of the, it was very difficult technically to make that scene work. So I always was just so worried about getting it together in a way that seemed real just unto itself. And then, you know, but the screenplay was so good. And Russell, it, that all, all that rises and falls on Russell. You know, he was just extraordinary. And he's so consistent. I, I think what made it work is he's so consistent as an actor. And so his character is so consistent that it didn't feel like, oh, now we're in some spacey, weird, you know, scene. It just felt like we were still stuck with his character. And I think that that's the key to all of it. The key to, like, when you say cut, cut into stock footage or you know, newsreel footage or changing aspect ratios like we did in um, in Transformers 3, that it was in the beginning, there's a moon landing and we're using real footage with shot footage and it, you know, the sides and the up, the, up, the up and down and the sides go in and out. And nobody really notices because you're so gripped as an audience that that stuff doesn't matter. I mean, you know, it, it, what, what matters is the storytelling and the acting and, the, and how you're as an editor able to get the audience so engaged that that stuff it's just part of the it's part of the story, so that nobody questions it. And you know, I think it's a, that in the insider, but it's all, like I said, it's it's the strength of the screenplay and, and Russell Crowe's performance that makes that work. Hmm. So, I've got a question here that asks about what it's like to work in the present time as hmm. an editor. You're, you're at home, right? So that's part yeah, of that. My living room. Yes. I'll talk about that, but I mean. One of the things that I'm aware of is that I haven't been to the movies since March. I haven't seen anything on a big screen since March. Anything that you make right now, they're going to be watching on a small screen. So how do you react? So that's two separate questions. One is, what do you think about when somebody watches your work on a small screen? I'm thinking of John Stewart at the Oscars watching Lawrence of Arabia on an iPod, making fun of that. Uh, or um, the idea that things are so different right now in the COVID era. So what do, what do you make of going to the small screen? What do you, how are you managing the well, COVID? Well, um, you know, in terms of the make filmmaking part of it, we just, like I said, we just finished literally a week and a half ago, this News of the World, which is supposed to come out Christmas Day and it stars Tom Hanks. It's a big Christmas movie, you know, it's, and um, right now that's the plan still. We cut it for the big screen. I mean, and I really don't cut differently for television. Um, people may shoot a little differently. I mean, the close-ups tend to be a little closer in television. Um, you know, first time feature directors often make that mistake of shooting close-ups like 
that, you know, um, for the big screen that it's a little off putting, it can be a little off putting. Um, so I just cut, I, I, I usually pretty much cut the same. The only thing, if I cut 3D, a 3D film, I, I'll cut a little differently um, because, you know, you have to understand how long it takes a person's eye to, to sort of recognize that something's in 3D. But I haven't really cut anything that what I'm working on now or news of the world. I mean, I cut it for story. I mean, I don't, I don't really think about, I mean, I might think, oh, I don't want to stay in this super wide shot if it's going to be on TV, but we're still considering the news of the world is going to come out in theaters and certain films that they, they'll end up holding and certain films they'll have to, I don't, I don't think they know what they're going to do yet. I mean, I can tell you that studios are scrambling. Uh, they're trying to figure out the new world and how to, do things and how to stay afloat, how to keep people employed. Uh, I've been lucky, or I, yeah, I mean, I was on a film that just at the right spot, we were just about to show it to the studio. Uh, I think it was supposed to be on March 15th and I left, I was in London, I left London on the two days before and knowing that I probably wouldn't be coming back. But so I came back here and I was able a couple of weeks later set up in my living room and the great thing about editing and the great thing about the way the current state of technology is that I'm, I have my, my I've, uh, I have media here, I have all the media here, local media. I have two, uh, two assistants and one in Pasadena, one downtown LA. I had four assistants in London, all at their houses and all the visual effects team. There were like 14 people. Everybody was, oops, everybody was connected locally or uh, connected through the internet and everybody had their own local storage. So we were able to move stuff around, you know, from continent to continent pretty smoothly. Um, I mean, it was pretty, it's pretty incredible. And I have this system I, on my, on my laptop called Evercast where I can, you know, it's like zoom where I can talk to the director, but I can also, I can run my avid, which I'm sitting at and he will see what's on my avid screen. So it's like, he's in the room. I can talk to him. He can talk to me. I can run stuff for him. He can hear it. Same as I can hear it here. He can hear it there. And he's in London. So the technology, thank God, is, a, is at a point where I can keep working. Now, right now, nobody's, nobody's really starting anything up, so the work will run out. Um, I was lucky enough to get a, a, a job on a film I'm recutting right now, which will take me you know, another month or so. And after that, no one knows. But um, okay. I'm considering myself one of the lucky ones right now. I think you're one of the lucky ones as well. Know, Listen, we have another uh, question about Argo here. Uh, for Argo, right off the bat, I was curious about how the Iranian Revolution was being handled through the eyes of an American audience. While editing, are you concerned with how the perspective comes off? Do you often need to step back to make sure it holds up to some truth? Again, that's, that's kind of an interesting question. No, it also. is. And yes, the answer is we, you do pay special attention to make sure that your own political beliefs aren't, you know, don't get transposed onto the film. The film has to be its own thing. I mean, News of the World, like I said, we just finished. We were very, in, 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 you know, in a highly charged political time, it just, currently, this film happens, the, the film happens to be highly political too, and it's set in 1870, because there was a lot of, you know, it was just after the Civil War, and there was still a lot of, you know, it's not like the Civil War ended and everything was great. So, <laughs> You know, that, that, that permeates the entire film, although that's not what the film is about. So we just were very careful to be extra cautious about, you know, you know making it a film about liberal politics. Um, we just wanted the film to speak for itself, to be, to be fair to, and, and try and present all sides of, the, uh, of, the, of any, any equation and then let people decide for themselves. We, we were, you know, but at the same time, you have to take a point of view. I mean, I would, I mean, same thing with Zero Dark Thirty, same thing with The Imitation Game, you know, films that are based on reality that you're taking so, some amount of license with the storytelling. But you, you know, we try to be hyper vigilant about not, you know, imposing our own feelings into it. I mean, it's hard to, you know, you kind of do, but you want to make it so that it comes out from inside and not you know, not laying it on the top, you know what I mean? You don't want to put a hat on a hat. You want it to, people to get that message, but you want to get it through, the, through your story, not some heavy handed thing you did. No, oh, it needs to be organic. I mean, yeah, it has to feel part of the story. I mean, because 
you, and what, what happens though is you get used to it and you think, oh no, this is, and then you, you start showing the film to people and you see it and they're just like friends and family and you start seeing it through their eyes and you realize, no, 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 I'm, we're pushing this way too hard. We can just, you start to feel it when other people are in the room. So yeah, we're extra vigilant and we're extra, you have an extra sense of responsibility just because it's a true story. You want to make sure that, you know, in Ben's character, Tony Mendez, I mean, we, Tony was on set a lot. I got to know him really well. You know, we, he's an American hero. We wanted to make sure we did justice to him. You know, we, in the same thing with Alan Turing and the imitation game or the CIA and, um, in Zero Dark Thirty, we, you know, we wanted to make sure that these people were represented fairly and accurately. Ethically, okay. Um, there's a couple of professional development questions here, uh, Billy. Uh, I have a question that was posed earlier uh, about how did you get started? I think I'm sure everybody wants to know that. And then uh, another question just came up said, how did you initially get connected with Michael Kahn? So, that's two questions. You can answer them in any order you wish. Yeah, well, um, I actually fell in love with editing at Temple University. Um, I took a class there in my senior year called Experimental Video, with a professor named Ed Cornell, who was on loan, I guess, from Cal State. I mean, or he was doing a semester or a year at Temple, and he was very inspiring to me and saw a lot of the material I edited and was very positive about it. And, suggested that I might think about that as a career. So it was incredible to get that, you know, feedback from somebody. I'd never, nobody, nobody in my family has ever done anything really in the creative world. There were, my family comes to the restaurant business. So um, it wasn't something I was really thinking about as a career really until I started going to film school and falling in love with it. So, and then Ed was really supportive of me. So I came out to LA with the, uh, with the idea of being a film editor. And through a series of lucky breaks, I got a job as a production assistant or a gopher, really, you know, means go for coffee, go for lunch. And, and that company put me on to a, uh, after about six months of working my tail off, they put me on to a, a television movie. Uh, they asked me if I wanted to be a, a set production assistant. And I asked them if I could be the, uh, if I could be the apprentice editor. And, and I would have never asked that if I hadn't, if I hadn't been naive, because if somebody said to me today, they asked me to be a production assistant, but I'd rather be an assistant editor. I would say, don't rock the boat, take the job. <laughs> but I didn't know any better. So I said, well, can I be an apprentice editor? And they said, yes. And luckily for me, this television movie was being edited by a guy named John Wright, who was, uh, and went on to cut speed and the hunt for red October and several other great films. And, he and his assistant trained me how to be an assistant, like in the way to do it in a, in, on a feature film, like top level. So I became a very good assistant. And um, I ended up working for a guy named Bruce Green, who used to be Michael Kahn's assistant. And when Michael was looking for a new first assistant, Bruce recommended me. And at first I didn't want to because he had a very bad reputation as being terrifying the assistants and terrorizing the assistants. <laughs> so I, and the first round I passed, I actually didn't, I did, I said, no, I don't want to do that. I just, you know, and then I went on to cut a film. I left, I stopped being an assistant and I cut a film, a very low budget film that was terrible and never got released. And um, I went back and assisted again after that. And then the opportunity came up to work for Michael Kahn again. And I realized how important it would be to have somebody like that as a mentor, not just for professional connections, but also to learn from. And he's, you know, arguably the, one of the best two or three editors in the world. And I thought, you know, the, having gone through the experience of cutting this low budget film and having nothing come of it and seeing that world of low budget films and how long it might take, I decided to go back and assist some more, have, get, get, have you know, and I was lucky enough to get the job offer for Michael again and learned an incredible amount from him. And then I also had him in my corner as a mentor. So when people would call him for a recommendation, they would say that he would just say, you know, Billy's great. And if it doesn't work out, I'll cut the movie for free. So it was great to have somebody say that, obviously. I mean, and nobody, fortunately, nobody ever asked him to cut the movie for free. But um, so I got, that's how I got hooked up with him. And I ended up, 
you know, working for four years and it was an incredible experience. It was very difficult and a lot of hours and it was a lot of craziness, but you know, he took me under his wing and he taught me about editing and he trained me to take criticism and he trained me to look at things in, in, a, in a different way, in a more creative way and look at things for storytelling. And he just taught me everything. And, um, and then, like I said, he, he recommended me for jobs. He stood behind me and he's been incredible to me both he and, you know, and when I work, and Steven Spielberg has been incredible to me and Frank Marshall and Kathleen Kennedy, they've all, that's all that same group. And they've been incredible to me, incredible to me through my whole career. So, it's and I'm sure you give back, right? Give like, like you're doing now. The, well, yeah, I mean, I, yes, I do this. I'm actually, I, I, yesterday was, I got a rush of, uh, like I got asked to do uh, a Chapman film school. They wanted me to go and, and not go, but like Zoom something for the graduate film program. I've done that there before. I've, you know, I'm doing a thing for AC at the end of the month, and then I'm writing an article for some magazine about my experience on on News of the World this weekend, and I have some other requests. So I, I always try and do all that stuff because um, what Michael did for me is irreplaceable. So I try and, you know, I'm not Michael Kahn, but I, you know, I try to help the assistants that, you know, have gone on to edit I to help them, you know, with their careers as well, because I think that you know, you want to pass along, you know, pay it forward to the people, you know, who, who deserve a break. And because it was without my break, I would have been, you know, I would have still been working in a delicatessen. Wow. Well, thank you for paying it forward. So I think we have time for one last question. And here's from Bill Daly, uh, alum Bill Daly, who I know very well. And you, I'm sure you do too, mm -hmm. uh, Billy. Yes. And Bill Daly asked specifically, what was the running time of Argo, at the director's cut, versus the final version that went out to theaters? Was very much cut. Um, I, th I mean, I'm, I'm guessing, but I, I think the first cut was in the two hours and 20 minute, two hours and 25 minute world. So, I mean, I think it was, the film came out of that like an hour and 57 minutes. Um, well, like I was talking about earlier, we cut a lot of, we cut that whole storyline, really. I mean, we cut, that was a bunch of scenes. In fact, the movie was probably sitting at 207, I think, or something like that. And we were kind of thinking we were pretty much done. And then we got the suggestion from Bradley Cooper and that took another like seven or eight, eight minutes out of the film by doing that. So we, that was all those scenes I talked about earlier. And then, you know, in the normal course of trimming and, you know, starting, you know, like when you have a first cut, you have the beginning, middle and end of every scene when you're, cutting a hot, and so you have like, you know, a hundred, hundred little movies all strung out together. So you're not gonna make them into one movie. So, you know, you decide to come in in the middle, leave a scene early, take lines out, take, you know, lose scene. So in the normal course of editing, we probably lost 20 minutes or so. And then there's one thing at the end, we probably lost another seven or eight really fast, you know, and what, you usually don't lose seven or eight minutes in one day. Right. Um, it's more of a process. So that was, you know, wasn't too bad. I mean, I've been on movies that, on National Treasure 2, the first cut was three hours and 45 minutes. And we had, we had a 12 week post-production, meaning everything done in 12 weeks when you usually get about 26 weeks. And we had to lose an hour and 45, almost two hours of the movie. And wow. we had no time, and the director had, a, had his first baby, well, his wife had his first baby during the, making, during the post-production as well. But the brilliant thing that he did was right. He we had to do some pickups, and he wrote a scene. It was able, we sh we shot a scene with Ed Harris and, and Nicholas Cage, and we were able to get out like thirty minutes of footage just by using this scene instead of the other thirty minutes. It like circumvented all this other action by shooting this one scene. So that was a genius idea by John. So um, because sometimes it's hard to take half a movie out, you know. <laughs> well. Uh, this is sort of going into what we'll have as our very last question here. And somebody uh, has asked, Mary's asked, generally, how long do you work on a particular film? Now, I know all films are different, but if, say, News of the World, how long uh, were you working on that film? Well, News of the World, I started in September, and I was supposed to be done in the beginning of June, but I ended up being done, you know, last week because of COVID. Um, but I would say generally features I'm on for anywhere from nine months to a year. Um, it's usually like a half a year shooting, half a year cutting, approximately. I've been on films for 18, 19 months. 
and I did the imitation game, I think in seven months, six and a half, seven months, because it was a low budget film. So, you know, it depends on how much money the studio has. Um, if it's a small budget film, they're going to shorten the post-production just because everything is shortened and because the money is just doesn't exist to do it any, any other way. So, um, but on a sort of medium to large budget feature, it's probably nine months to a year. Okay. And are you ever working on more than one major project at the same time? I, I, I'd go crazy. If I, I only did it. once. Um, I was recutting two films at the same time. I was recutting Kangaroo Jack, <laughs> the Jerry Bruckheimer <laughs> film. And at the same time, I was recutting Veronica Garin, which is also a Jerry Bruckheimer film, much better film. Uh, with, um, and, um, and it was very weird. They were two cutting rooms right across the hall. Two, one was a Lightworks, one was an Avid, and one was a serious, serious drama, and one was a goofy movie about a kangaroo. So, but I did those at the same time, and that was really weird. But, wow. um, but you know, you get like I, I've moved my cutting rooms in my, my living room. It's been I've cut like in a trailer. I've cut in my, on a plane. And once you're doing it, it's like you know, it takes three minutes and I'm, my head's in it and it doesn't, I've done this a long time, so I don't need much time for, I could probably work, you know, in the restroom if I had to, you know, it's like, I guess I'm so used to it. I could, I just change gears rather quickly. Okay. So. Wow. This has been great, Billy. Thank you so much. My pleasure. I mean, we covered a lot of stuff. We were supposed to talk about Argo, but we talked about lots of other things as well. Thank you so much. And I'm going to hand over again to Kate, I think, to wrap things up. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Thank you all for joining us. And a special thank you to both Paul and Billy for that wonderful conversation. Um, I hope you join us again on August 28th when we have a discussion with Gary uh, Dolberman about it. Um, have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe and go Owls. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you. I wasn't happy with that. Was it okay? Yeah. I, stumbled. I wasn't used to it. I stumbled around in the beginning. I think I got better. No? No, I, I, I thought you did great. Okay. I thought you were great. Oh, thanks. Oh, I didn't know.